Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace. This is episode two of three in our new series on internet obsession, but really information obsession in general. I'll explain why later. Make sure you subscribe for more episodes and also you can find an audio version of this story and all of our other stories down below in the description. There's a link, but you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, you name it, we should be there. If we're not, let us know. You can tweet at us at Seeker or me at Trace Dominguez. Okay, enough of that. Today, we're gonna talk about how our obsession with information is changing the world out here. I'm talking about the stuff that you do on your phone and how it's gonna be changing everything else that you do when you're not on your phone. We're gonna talk about the history and engineering and politics of information obsession and so much more. Again, make sure you subscribe. Let's kick into it. Okay, so at the end of act one, we were talking about getting obsessed and how they get you obsessed, they with the quotes around it. But does that matter? What could it possibly do? And what could that do to us is an interesting question, right? But first we have to understand how many people are actually out there on the internet. Internet usage has exploded. The International Telecommunications Union found in 2000 that there were 738 million people on the internet all over the world. That's not very many relative to the world population of 6 billion or more, right? That's it, just 738 million people. In 2015, it was 3.2 billion people. That's like half of every human that we know exists in the universe, and they're all on the internet. You know, maybe there are other humans somewhere else. We'll have to wait till Daniel figures out the Stargate to do that, but whatever. On average, Americans spend 10 hours a day staring at their screens, and that's at minimum. For me, it's a lot more because, you know, I'm staring at screens for you all. What we wanted to know is what all this screen time is doing out in the world. Is it really changing things, not just in the Estados Unidos, you know? We're changing the infrastructure of countries all over the planet in response to us being obsessed with sucking information out of the internet. Uh, but let's be clear, this is not the first time this has happened. So before we get to the actual infrastructure and the changes, let's address the history here, because this is Seeker Plus and we love it when we get to do some history. In the 1700s, books finally became affordable for the average person. You could just go out and buy a book. And this changed the world. Now we had something called reading mania. People were really upset and scared because all these people, they weren't talking to each other. They weren't walking around the town square. I mean, I don't actually know that, maybe they were, but they were reading books. They had their heads down reading a book. Remember the opening lines of Beauty and the Beast? This was a real problem that people were worried about. It was derided and feared. By the 1880s, the New York Times wrote that novels were unwholesome. Books were unwholesome, they were unwanted by the media elite. They wrote, the novel reader, quote, detests stories in which the interest is not exaggerated and pulled up 10 times as high as the interests of ordinary life. They exaggerated normal life in these books and ugh, who would want that? They called it unhealthy. They called reading spasmodic action of the imagination. It would affect our imagination. Hmm, that sounds so familiar. Like perhaps our imaginations would be affected by the media around us and we would have shorter attention spans. This was in the 1880s. Today, we have the Journal of Neuroscience, which did an fMRI study where, again, they look at blood flow to different parts of the brain. They also added something to that to study what happens in our brains when we read. Eye tracking. So that way, when they were looking at the fMRI, they knew exactly which word people were looking at while they were reading. They called this new system the fixation-related fMRI, or fire MRI, which just sounds awesome. Their hypothesis was that when you read, you're associating real actions in real life in your brain. That's represented in their research as well. The brain areas dealing with manipulation of objects and carrying out physical actions would light up when people would read words on a page. Words translate in our minds, in our imaginations, to real actions. So if you're reading a story about a wizard and you know living in the UK or whatever, you're picturing those actual actions. When he grasps his wand, you're picturing him in your head grasping a wand. Another study done with 18th century literature specifically found executive function also lit up and our old friend, the pleasure center. So not unlike social media today, reading helps give us reward in our brains. 
We like reading things. We like social interaction. We like understanding. We like being entertained, and we wanted more of it. So you know what we did? We learned to print and write and create a whole supply chain to provide us with that entertainment. In this case, in the 1880s, it was with books. We changed the world around us to suit what we wanted. Eventually, we started creating other things to do that same thing. I'm going to fly through a few of them really quick just to give you the idea. I think you probably get it, but, you know, we're going to go Malcolm Gladwell, and I'm going to kick the dead horse on this. Telephones, think of all the pop culture there is around telephones, the sense of connection. There are not a lot of studies about this telephone addiction kind of idea, but I'm sure we all know of people obsessing over being connected, about feeling anxiety, about missing our calls, and we can feel that. And the new scientist had an op-ed in 1986 where they had something that they dubbed the teleholic, which was a person who would use the telephone for long periods. They could have eight to ten people on a single call. That was especially common with teenagers. And they were dubbed antisocial and psychologically imbalanced. They were called sad, bad, mad, and shy. Sound familiar? Of course it does. You've probably heard that about your social media use. In the 1980s as well, New York Times writer Trish Hall wrote, the U.S. is becoming addicted to telephone chatter. Some people have as many as two telephones for a single person. Can you believe it? There were also fax machines. One guy was called out, which was a little mean, for faxing his girlfriend in Japan. What are we doing with ourselves, they were asking in the late 80s. Do young people have no inhibitions? Seriously. Seriously, they were asking that. People took this thing that they liked and they started putting it around. Telephones were everywhere. We got them at home. We got them at work. We got them in airplanes in the 1980s. And the media kept commenting about how teleholics were the reason we were doing this. There is some science behind this. Uh, science Reports has a study about social interaction and how it gives people meaning. And it lights up in the ventral striatum, which you probably already have guessed, is part of the reward system, our good old friend. What about television addiction? Of course, that exists as well. We've all heard and talked about that. In 2003, a Scientific American piece wrote about people who watch a lot of television potentially having some kind of substance dependence. It was very similar to drug use, is what they were trying to say. You could have repeated, unsuccessful attempts to stop watching TV, and then you would get withdrawal from the entertainment that you would get while watching. The Journal of Behavior Addiction in 2013 did a literature review of all of the different studies around television addiction and found the first mention of it being back in 1954. Televisions then were much smaller, black and white, you know, it was a very different time. And they found that it was addictions not unlike gambling and substance abuse that most mirrored television addiction. And there were behaviors that were involved as well. They called it food for the senses, and they said it was very shocking. Quote, TV addiction might be expected particularly among persons experiencing inadequate turnover of mesolimbic dopamine. That's right, the reward system, back again. Little dance break. So, New York Times writer Roland Nethaway actually called television, quote, an opiate for naive children. That was a headline. We began to change the infrastructure of the world for all of these different things. Books, and telephones, we crossed cables from coast to coast, we built dishes, we launched satellites, we bounced the signals off those satellites, all to satisfy this craving for information, for connection, for social interaction, right? And yes, we haven't even gotten to the internet yet. This was all before that, dating back hundreds of years. What I'm trying to say by going through all of these different things is we build the infrastructure to serve what we want. The infrastructure doesn't just happen to us and then we react. The world adapts to us. We are not victims of our infrastructure. Books gave us unprecedented access to power. Newspapers gave us unprecedented access to power. Radio, television, cell phones. Do you remember the Crackberry, those of us who are a little older? Yeah, the Crackberry was what they called the Blackberry because people were just on it all the time. And now there's the internet. We adapt the real world to wants over time. Nearly 90% of American teens report being active users on social media. The youth have continuously outpaced other age groups in adopting new media. That's according to Leonard in 2015. And the examples of how the infrastructure has changed outside of, you know, building cable lines and launching satellites to communicate better. And there are some examples of how we've changed infrastructure outside of launching satellites and building cable lines and such. 
We physically changed roads and sidewalks after the inventions of cell phones. For example, in 2014, China added a sidewalk lane in one of their cities. DC actually had one first here in the United States as a joke, uh, but it was copied around the world. Some people actually thought maybe this is a good idea to put people who are staring at their cell phones in a separate lane in the sidewalk as people who are you know, walking with purpose, if you will. <laughs> I couldn't actually find any follow-ups on the original flurry of articles about this in 2014, so if anybody knows if those sidewalk lanes are still there or if they're used, please tweet at us, at Seeker. There are people who are trying to fight this around the world to make sure that people aren't just looking at their phones and walking around with explicit infrastructure, like in Singapore, where they're putting traffic lights embedded in the sidewalk. So, you know, when you're looking down at your phone, you can see the the traffic light down there, and you know not to walk into, into traffic and hurt yourself. Um, they literally have green and red signs embedded under the sidewalk. It's amazing. There are other places that do this as well. The Netherlands has crosswalks that are built to uh, keep you from using your phone. In Germany, they have train stations that are designed to make sure that people using their phones don't get hurt. And in Thailand, they also have mobile phone lanes where people can walk and use their phone at the same time. It's pretty amazing. The Ohio State University has a study where they talked about distraction walking, and they found that 1,500 pedestrians were injured in 2010 alone, and that has doubled since 2005. And it's not just silly academics talking about this. The National Safety Council that monitors all of this stuff found in 2017 there were 6,000 fatalities related to people being on their phone and not paying attention. In Honolulu, they're actually making it illegal to look at your phone while on a crosswalk. You could get a ticket for that, and it's an expensive one. In the developed world, we're not changing the infrastructure quite as much as in the developing world, mainly because we already have a lot of it built. But now that cell phones exist, the developing world is seeing a lot of infrastructure change, or maybe not change, that we would have had to do. Let me give you an example. We built telegraph lines, phone lines, cable lines, and cell phone towers that have cable and microwave connections to each other. In Nigeria, everyone had a cell phone, but they probably didn't build all of the infrastructure that we built to get there. They built mainly cell phone towers, right? They didn't necessarily need to build telephone and telegraph lines to get information to every single person's house everywhere in the country. The problem was they didn't have internet access to Nigeria. The big back channels that the internet uses, the big cables that are underneath the water that ship it across the world, those didn't connect to Nigeria. So Funke Opeke, I don't actually know if that's how to pronounce her name, but she is awesome. She started a company and got access to the internet in Nigeria through a backhaul service, and they got access to an undersea cable. And now people in Nigeria don't need cable modems. They can just use their cell phones and access the internet. Who needs wires, you know? There are also all these other plans to get internet to places without building all of this infrastructure. And you could argue that these plans are infrastructure in themselves. Uh, balloons from Google, satellites from all sorts of different companies, drones from Facebook, and a whole bunch of other crazy ideas to try and deliver internet to people around the world, all in the feeding of this information obsession. Over time, we've slowly demanded this stuff from ourselves. And there are people who are legitimately addicted to their devices, to television, to radio, to news. But there are also millions more who aren't addicted and are using these services. And with the internet, just like with telephones and letters and newspapers, they're pretty ubiquitous. So the point of this whole exercise is to say a couple of things. One, information obsession is not an internet thing, it's a human thing. We've always had internet obsession. Let's go back to reading mania just for a second. One Quartz piece by Charles Chu found, when he did the math, that the amount of time we spend on social media is equivalent to reading about 200 books a year. We could read that in the same amount of time, which is pretty incredible. Um, but does that mean things are worse now? I mean, if you had reading mania, couldn't you just read 200 books a year, right? Maybe it's the same. Maybe they were reading 200 books a year, and that was freaking people out in the same way that now we're reading our timelines all the time, and that's freaking people out. Maybe they're the same. I am not the person to ask if it is. You'd have to ask scientists and researchers. While researching this piece, uh, there was a really great piece on Timeline.com. It's uh, by Louis Anslow. You can check the link in the description. It's really, really cool. He did a lot of the research into newspapers and headlines. Uh, claims have been made about addiction to various technologies that we didn't get into, including comic books, video games, uh, the internet, of course, and virtual reality in a coming addictive way. 
So this is definitely a problem we're going to keep seeing. But we've got the internet now. It's, it's on 3.2 billion people's phones or computers, right? What happens when it gets to everyone? Should we change how we think about the internet and internet obsession and information obsession? Should we change that? Because in light of what we learned earlier with people taking advantage of our psychology and our reward systems, aren't we just giving another three, four billion people up to this problem? Shouldn't we fix it? I don't know how to do that. Maybe you have ideas. You can tell us in the comments. Do you even think this is a problem? You can tell us that too. Maybe it's just something we haven't gotten used to yet. I don't think there are people out there saying, you read too many books, right? So maybe we just haven't gotten used to this one yet. We'll see what comes next. Thanks everyone for watching Seeker Plus this week. I'm Trace, you can find me over on Twitter at Trace Dominguez, you can find us at Seeker. You can find the third episode of this series next week here on the YouTube channel, so make sure you subscribe. You can also find audio podcasts of all of our stories over on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, iTunes, you name it, we're there. Again, thank you, we'll see you next time.